Hey everyone. Today I'll be introducing some self-managed or self-organized societies. If you don't know what I mean by terms like self-managed or maybe spontaneous order, please watch at least one of the videos I've made over the past few weeks. There's a link to the full playlist in the description, along with all the books and articles I refer to in this video. This video is number six in a series of why free, independent people and societies can exist and have existed throughout human history. I'll be introducing these societies only. I won't go into too much detail because that'll take forever and you can do that for yourself. I think the place to start in any discussion of free societies is the fact that until the rise of so-called civilization, and by the way, I've made a whole playlist on that too, all humans lived in free, non-hierarchical societies. People lived in small groups of hunter-gatherers, and they didn't have permanent structures of rule. Kings, empires, governments, the powerful church, none of these institutions existed. So when people tell me, we can't live without rulers and leaders or whatever, I ask them who we are. Certainly not all humans. Maybe domesticated humans. James C. Scott, in a book that I will be referencing in a couple of minutes, said the following. Until shortly before the Common Era, the very last 1% of human history, the social landscape consisted of elementary self-governing kinship units that might occasionally cooperate in hunting, feasting, skirmishing, trading, and peacemaking. It did not contain anything one could call a state. In other words, living in the absence of state structures has been the standard human condition. And as I explained in my video on the state, all that was interrupted and people were forced to settle and farm and obey their masters. But even then, the drive for freedom has always existed. And from the midst of the chaos of external rule, people can still free themselves. People sought refuge in places out of the way, such as the Amazon where today indigenous people are losing their ancestral homes to agricultural and industrial expansion, aided, of course, by state muscle. Living outside the state was a realistic option until maybe a few hundred years ago. Scott's book is called The Art of Not Being Governed, an anarchist history of upland Southeast Asia. In it, he explains the history of the politically autonomous region in the highlands of Southeast Asia that uh, anthropologist dubbed Zomia in 2002. Um, the, uh, these groups uh, mainly descended from groups that left the lowland states. The people of the whole region reorganized their social structures, their folklore, their agricultural even, to be inaccessible to the state. I find it a fascinating book because it shows how even planting crops and telling stories can be a choice to strategically avoid domination. Those escaping predatory lowland states were runaway conscripts and slaves, uh, war refugees, religious minorities, people fleeing taxes, and maybe just others who figured it would happen to them sooner or later. When the state attempts to incorporate stateless people, it always clothes its actions in the language of civilizing the barbarians, development, economic progress, literacy, art, and so on. However, it inevitably does so by force, forcing people to settle, work, and follow laws. But it's almost impossible to subdue the people in the Southeast Asian highlands, partly because they're just hard to get to, but also because their social structures have no hierarchy that encroaching states could have used as agents of control. 
They couldn't co-opt the president because they had no presidents. Their subsistence routines, according to James, uh, their social organization, their physical dispersal, and many elements of their culture, far from being the archaic traits of a people left behind, are purposefully crafted both to thwart incorporation into nearby states and to minimize the likelihood that state-like concentrations of power will arise among them. State evasion and state prevention permeate their practices and often their ideology as well. And good for them. The long existence of Zomia disproves the hypotheses that we require some kind of coercive hierarchy to function as societies, or that an elite with coercive authority will always emerge over time. Now, I don't want to romanticize so-called primitive people and cultures. They're so varied, there's not much you can say about all of them. Some of them are hunter-gatherers, and some of them are settled. Some of them have permanent social hierarchy, and some don't. Some of them go to war seemingly all the time, and some of them never do. And none of them require our intervention. But by observing them remotely, we can learn about our own nature and what kind of social organization is possible. Society Against the State by Pierre Clastre starts with a discussion on social structure. The book is a kind of precursor to the art of being governed, set among the indigenous people of South America, and his findings are similar. He takes great pains explaining how cultures choose to avoid arbitrary hierarchy or concentrated power. Do you know about Dunbar's number? In the 1990s, anthropologist Robin Dunbar suggested humans could manage about 150 stable relationships with other people. Society Against the State, it, it doesn't mention the number, it goes into the complex social relations behind when a group splits. The number varies, you know, but usually once societies reach about 150 members, they tend to split up and become two groups. Unless, of course, they're forced into a political association by the state. Community self-governance seems to be able to work fine up to about 150 people. The problem comes when communities get bigger than that. If there are too many people, politics becomes coercive and divisive. In small societies, they organize to avoid politics itself altogether. Splitting up is part of preventing any one or any one group or family or faction from dominating. It doesn't mean that, that the people never come into contact again. It just means that each group governs itself. They still come together, as in a mutual defense pact or making decisions in confederation. That's what happened in Ireland. Ireland was self-managed or anarchic for thousands of years until the British invaded. No state institutions existed in that time. Ireland was organized into confederations called, and I don't think I'm getting this right, but I'll pronounce it the way it's spelled, Tuatha, which were basically, I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong, independent political units that came together maybe once a year or so, to vote on common policies. Tuatha may have had several thousand people each uh, as communities, so there may have been some coercion on the local level. Uh, but people were free to, and did, secede from their confederations and, and join another. Now that's freedom of association. Laws weren't just changed at the whim of rulers, because Ireland wasn't ruled, but when people voted in an assembly to change them. Laws weren't created by a clique, as in our time, nor was justice dispensed by one monopoly provider. Parties to disputes selected from a number of professional jurists who were chosen for knowledge, wisdom, integrity, and so on. Several schools of jurisprudence existed to choose from. 
If someone hurt someone else and didn't make up for it the way they were supposed to, the entire community would consider them an outlaw. Ireland suffered small-scale conflicts, for sure, but without a central state that taxes and conscripts, these conflicts were negligible compared to the bloodbaths going on in Europe at the same time. I talk about Ireland, but there's a good chance if you live anywhere in the Americas, there was until quite recently a relatively free group of indigenous people who used to live where you do now. If you learn about their history, you might see their systems as more appealing than living under the colonial states that dominate today. Certainly colonists used to think that. They would run away to live with the surrounding tribes sometimes. You could learn about the Iroquois Confederacy, which was a great way of ensuring autonomy and peace, at least until it was destroyed by the British, like Ireland was. The British Empire has killed free societies all over the world. Opportunities to escape state control arise during revolutions and wars. During Egypt's revolutionary uprising nine years ago, every neighborhood in Cairo formed within 48 hours, mind you, popular committees for self-governance. When the police suddenly left the streets, they opened up the jails and letting out these, these thugs who they intended would terrorize the people into begging the police to come back. Instead, despite thousands of years of dictatorship, the people organized and substituted for the police, protecting the people in their communities, making decisions together, and even cleaning the streets. During the Spanish Civil War, the state was in crisis and lost its ability to govern large parts of the country. Spanish anarchists led a movement that liberated Catalonia, and some other parts of the country. Workers controlled factories, peasants collectivized farms, people used barter instead of money, started libraries, schools, and cultural centers, and, of course, organized militias to fight in the Civil War. Spain's brief experiment with anarchy was maybe not perfect or utopian, because war, of course, imposes a variety of constraints on people but it could be replicated and improved on. In Ukraine, in the wake of the Russian Revolution of 1917, a free state emerged comprising millions of people. Throughout the Russian Empire, as imperial authority collapsed, workers, soldiers, and peasants began to reject any outside authority and establish self-governing cooperatives. They began by arresting state officials, occupying government buildings, and disarming the police. Of course, they were eventually cr ruthlessly crushed by the central government, just as the communities in Spain were. But they demonstrated, like all the others, that freedom is desirable and practical, if it can be maintained in the face of state aggression. In the, wa in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War, uh, in 1871, the Paris Commune was established. The Commune was independent of the French state and was self-regulating, inspired in part by the anarchist philosopher Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. They virtually eliminated social hierarchy, both in the neighborhood and in the workplace. The armed workers defended Paris against first German soldiers and then, for some time, French government aggression but eventually they were overwhelmed. But they did pretty well in the time they had, though it was short. As Mikhail Bakunin said at the time, contrary to the belief of authoritarian communists, so-called communists, which I deem completely wrong, that a social revolution must be decreed and organized either by a dictatorship or by a constituent assembly emerging from a political revolution, our friends, the Paris Socialists, believed that revolution could neither be made nor brought to its full development except by the spontaneous and continued action of the masses, the groups, and the associations of the people. Our Paris friends were right a thousand times over. 
nowadays, you could go to Exarchia, Exarchia, I don't know how you say it, in Athens, or Christiania in Copenhagen, which are kind of anarchist enclaves in the heart of Europe. They're certainly not ideal situations since they're surrounded by states, and in, at least in the case of Athens, fascist gangs, but they still try to maintain their independence. You could visit Marina Leda, Spain, which has become a successful village because it has seceded from Spain's capitalist economy. You could go to Cheran in Mexico, where they kicked out predatory police, drug traffickers, and loggers alike. It seems to have been pretty free and peaceful since then. The Zapatista Revolution in Chiapas has successfully carved out whole sections of Mexico to be self-governed. Now, perhaps the most exciting modern example uh, of, of what we're talking about is that of Rojava in Syria, where thanks to the civil war and the resistance against the government, the Kurds of northern Syria have been able to carve out a free system for themselves. Like Paris was inspired by Proudhon, Rojava's emancipation was indirectly inspired by everyone's favorite libertarian municipalist, Murray Bookchin and then passed on to Abdullah Öcalan, who directed his people in Rojava on how to build their new society. It functions by direct democracy and decentralization as a rule. It's eliminated discrimination based on sex and religion. It's become a model of tolerance, democracy, and environmental sustainability. And like all free societies, it's under attack. Now, some people will reject all these examples that I've just given because few, if any of them, are truly free, self-managed, self-organized societies. The societies that have existed without the state are already evidence that the state is not necessary. And if people really want to, they can live free. It's a common retort or an argument to all this that what we want is impossible, that the state's eventual domination or redomination of so many of these places proves that a free, egalitarian society couldn't possibly last. But everything depends on context. We've got free societies that have lasted for thousands of years. Maybe the state couldn't reach them, or they reached a compromise, History is full of compromises. It's also full of what-ifs. What if the people of the Paris Commune had persuaded more soldiers or guards to desert? Or if they just had more people doing the things that needed to be done? What if more European colonists had defected to the relative freedom of the neighboring indigenous people? What if we throw our support behind Rojava? What could it become? Freedom's possible, but it has a high price. Thanks for listening.